Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for your statement as well as the ranking member statement. A governor, Secretary, good to have you here. I uh, appreciate you being here today to talk about the budget. Uh, I think it was a bipartisan, um, maybe disgust is too big of a word, but disappointment with this budget. Um, I'm very concerned being somebody from rural America, and uh, quite frankly, you understand rural America, the impacts of this budget. The fact is, is that it came on prior to you being Secretary of Agriculture, but the real question here today is, how the hell do we fix it? Because it, it, it doesn't work. Right now, farm income, because of prices being in the toilet, is down about half of what it was uh, record year 2013, $62 billion drop. And as was pointed out by the chairman, and I believe the ranking member too, safety net programs are there for this exact reason. When times aren't always good in egg, we, all, we know that. And, and quite frankly, when, when prices drop, there needs to be a safety net to help manage risk. You were in Montana a few weeks ago. I appreciate you coming to our great state. Um, you, you said something that was, was a, a little bit disturbing, and that is says you wouldn't buy home insurance and hope that your house burnt down, would you? No, but the fact of the matter is Mother Nature is Mother Nature, and we know that Mother Nature is going to do things that's totally unpredictable, whether it's a drought in North Dakota this year or whether it's a hailstorm in, uh, in some other part of the country. Hell, I lost my barley crop a few years ago just because it rained really, really hard a day before I was supposed to cut it, literally. And so making sure that when disasters happen that we have a safety net is critically important. I want to close with this. I've had about a half dozen listening sessions around Montana, east, west, north, and south. Farmers and ranchers aren't asking for much, maybe with the exception of the EQIP program that they'd like to have plussed up. What they're asking for is no, let's not take a step backwards. Because if we take a step backwards, especially in this time when we have low commodity prices, and they truly are very bad. Example, I took the farm over in 1978. Prices are as low now as they were when I took the farm over in 78. And you know what a tractor or a pickup cost compared to what they did in 1978. So they just don't want to take a step back. And I think this budget takes a giant step back. And I think we need to flesh that out and find out what the Secretary of Ag is going to do about that moving forward. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you asked for the opening statement. I couldn't resist. Um, look, I, I, I want to thank you for being here. And I, I'm not going to go into the crop insurance stuff. I think the chairman's dealt with that appropriately. And, and, and you and I both know that there isn't a farmer alive that wouldn't rather get, get their check right. from the grain elevator or the livestock market than they would from, uh, from the federal government. And I also will tell you that in the case of insurance, I don't know anybody that's made money off of crop insurance. That's right. There have been a few that make some money off of hail insurance, but nothing off of crop insurance, okay, because it's, it's really pretty basic. So I'm, I want to talk, uh, talk about the rural development. Uh, the ranking member talked about it a little bit. It's a cut of 20%. Um, and this program is, is a program that, at least to my perspective, is overutilized, not underutilized. And and I know you said watch and see what happens, but the problem with cutting 20% out of this program is um, I got a list of about a dozen water systems that my staff just got me five minutes before this hearing um, that you're not going to see the negative effects till long after you and I are both out of these positions. And so um, what's, what's the thought there? I mean, because it's it's pretty basic stuff for rural development in rural America. And, and you know, I don't think it's any different in Georgia than it is in Montana or North Dakota or Oregon. Rural America is drying up. And if we do this, the infrastructure isn't there. We got problems. Could you address that a little bit? Certainly. I address it really by, the, uh, by uh, acknowledging that uh, rural development has, uh, has addressed some very serious needs. I like the fact that Many times these, these are skin-in-the-game programs where local, uh, uh, local needs are met with federal help in order yeah, to accomplish correct. things that are really good. I, I like that kind of leverage that we can get through federal expenditures by ensuring that either local money, uh, federal or state money, or private money are involved in these projects. I would say to the President's defense that uh, the day I was uh, sworn in, he convened a farmer, rancher, per forester, producer yep. roundtable there and he signed an executive order regarding rural prosperity and an interagency task force to deal with rural prosperity. I think, again, as we right-size this budget, you all know that uh, you're going to get a last stamp on this and the degree that you all believe that we're doing good. 
My comment about holding us accountable, Senator, is hold me accountable for the resources you give me. I'm gonna make. I'm a farmer at heart. I'm gonna make it go as far as you do, just like it. just like you do. So. And, and Mr. Secretary, I would just tell you that, and 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 it's just this way. You follow the money. I mean, words are one thing, and I'm not saying you. I'm talking about getting folks together and talking is good. We talk a lot of stuff in the Senate, mm -hmm. but. But if the money's not there, the R&D is, is just, I hate to say this, but it ain't going to happen. And, 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 I'm, and this isn't at you. I, I, what I am saying, though, is as Secretary of Ag, you're going to have a big role in what this committee does, believe it or not. If you come in and say, just like you said to, uh, to Senator Cochran, if you come in and say, you know what, R&D isn't where it needs to be, that's going to that's gonna hold a lot of weight with this. And by the way, R&D isn't where it needs to be. And you're right. And I would just tell you, soft lies. We never had that when I was growing up. Volmatoxin. Never had that five years ago. And it's for a number of reasons, because we're raising corn now in Montana instead of high-quality wheat. Uh, rust, blights, all this stuff. And, and by numbers. the way, so and I don't know if they've got Volmatoxin down in Georgia, but I'm going to tell you something. You know what they do in Montana? They pull the combine in at harvest time. They cut out the corners. They take it to the elevator. If it's got Volmatoxin, they set the field on fire. We need some R&D money. And by the way, as long as we're on, on that, organic has been the fastest growing. And I know the chairman of the Ag Committee hates organic. But the truth is, is that organic is the fastest growing part of the farm industry for the last 25 years. Let's put a little money in there to make sure that those guys are at least getting a fair shake. Okay? Fair enough. Good I enough. Don't you're, disagree. You're, you're, you're good. I, I would just tell you that uh, a couple things. Um, this is really really Montana-centric, eastern Montana-centric. We've got a little ag rancher cattle research station, a range research lab called Fort Keel in Miles City, Montana. Now, I'm going to tell you something. In my life, ranchers have never been anybody at the trough as far as I'm concerned. They've got some advantages on public land grazing and things like that, but they've never been anybody that's come in and say, we need this subsidy, we need this support, we need this. We got this little laboratory that helps ranchers figure out how to maximize their ability for cattle on, on range. And it has, it is proven, it has been around since 1924, and it has been proven benefits to the ranchers, I think throughout the country, but I can tell you absolutely unequivocally in the arid areas of this country. And it's, it's set to close down, I believe. And I would just ask you, why would we be doing that? I mean, we got more cattle and we got people in Montana. And I think that might be a good thing. <laughs> Is that a rhetorical question? No, why would, why, why would we be closing this down when, quite frankly, it's, it's one of the tools out there. I think we get an incredible bang for the buck. Yeah. I think I've expressed my, uh, my favor and, and my enthusiasm for uh, research and development in ag production and in various uh, components of that. And I think you will, if you are... Uh, have invited me to be an advisor to this committee over appropriations. I think you'll be, I think you'll be happy with the results. Well, I think I think you are. I, I don't want to speak for the chairman, but <laughs> your input on this budget is critical. And it, and it came down from the president. And, and I'll, I'll shut up. But the, the priorities I gather aren't your priorities in this budget. They were somebody else's. And I think there's a lot of people that serve in the United States Senate and Congress that don't understand production agriculture. They don't understand the challenges in rural America. I voted for you because I think you do. And if your voice isn't made loud and clear throughout this process about what's important, whether it's rural development or ag research or safety nets for farmers, then we're going to end up with a bill that isn't going to meet the needs of rural America. I'll just tell you that. That's how important you are. I don't think you'll find a stronger advocate for those things that you and I agree on, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, when uh, Se Senator Baldwin was bringing up her dairy issues uh, for your work there, and also on wheat grading, because it, it doesn't make any sense where he's the best wheat in the world, and it gets graded as feed going north, uh, so I appreciate that. USDA uh, last August uh, lifted a ban on Brazilian meat. Um, I uh, didn't like that, had a difference of discussion in your predecessor about that. Um, uh, it would previously was banned because of FMD, um, and and quite frankly, uh, USDA uh, chose to open that market up again. In March, as you well know, investigators in Brazil shed light on a scandal involving meatpacking plants, uh, paying off inspectors, uh, selling expired meat, meat that was treated with acid, uh, mixed with good meat, sold to the marketplace. 
um, EU and China banned uh, Brazil. I, I shouldn't say banned. They halted the imports. Um, the United States did not. We don't have country of origin labeling in this country. We have a USDA seal, and what happens when we bring in tainted meat from somewhere else? It gets stamped with that seal, uh, unless it's rejected, but this wasn't. And being a country, and this isn't brag, this is fact, that raises the best meat in the world, and I know that because I eat a lot of it. Um, it it's ridiculous that we're allowing in tainted meat and, and really uh, raising heck with our markets and, uh, and quite frankly, not... Uh, not doing right by the consumers or the producers. Um, so, so I know you were just new to the slot. I mean, you were just freshly minted, so to speak, in this position. Um, wouldn't it have been wise to just kind of hit the pause button on this stuff and say, look, until we get to the bottom of this and find out what's really going on, we are, uh, we're going to halt that import for a while. Well, Senator, I think uh, my FSIS people have assured me that the, the plants you refer to in Brazil were none of those exporting, and uh, we've gone, we did go to a 100% inspection. You probably are aware that these, uh, these programs are guided by uh, WTO and uh, bilateral trade agreements that make it rather difficult to do that, although, as you know, we've been the victims of that, uh, getting back into China after 14 years over yeah. a, a one Canadian case of BSE. That's right. Also, avian influenza in China. When you have it in one small area is confined, then our whole nation gets out of there. But I don't think we can preach fair and free trade if we don't practice that. And I, I hear your concerns. Uh, I had concerns as well until I uh, talked to our chief of our uh, food safety inspection that assured me that we were going 100% and that I think we have programs in place that once that meat comes in here, it is not allowed to be re-exported with a USDA stamp. So you're confident that it is indeed 100% the re-inspections that are that, taking place? I have to rely on my people who have, the FSIS has a great reputation, as you know, worldwide, and I'm relying on them to uh, to do what they okay. tell me they're doing. And, and I would just tell you that when, when it comes to food, is pretty important. I mean, I'm 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 telling you, and and, and if we're, if we're putting bad stuff in our bodies from some other country, I don't know I don't know why that can't be. That's not free trade. That's putting crap in our bodies, and it's really impacting our consumers and our producers. And so I I, I know you know that. I just want to say I think I think in this particular case, especially with the past history with Brazil, um, I think a more uh, measured approach would have probably been better. I understand. Uh, I think I want you to, I want to reiterate that we take food safety as zero tolerance. Okay, good. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the China beef deal. I think the opening up a market to 1.3 billion people is no small effort. And uh, you talked about some of the reasons that it wasn't there before. And, and I appreciate your great work as well as the others that you've already mentioned. One of the things that I read in the agreement um, was traceability. Uh, it's a big deal. Evidently, the Chinese, um, born, raised, slaughtered in the U.S., um, could have imported from Canada or Mexico, but subsequently raised and slaughtered in the U.S. Um, these are, these are um, reasonably stringent audit trail requirements. Um, and do you think you can meet those? I do believe uh, we, we had great consultation with the beef industry. Uh, from producers to packers. Uh, actually, the traceability has to do with maybe one of your previous questions. China wanted to make sure they were not uh, importing Mexican or Canadian beef in that. We want, they wanted U.S. beef. Gotcha. Uh, our producers and packers said, yes, it's probably going to be a little more expensive. It's going to be a little more onerous, uh, but, uh, we're but they can do it. we're willing to do it. So a few years ago, we were on the cusp of having country of origin labeling. And one of the things the Packers said they couldn't do is they couldn't trace that product and keep that out of trail separate. I thought it was baloney then, and this kind of proves is baloney now. Do you have any comments on that? I think it's hamburger, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mixed beef. But the truth is, is that we were told that it could, it just flat couldn't be done, and now we're told it can be done, which I believe. I mean, I've dealt personally with enough audit trails that we can audit trail anything and right. show you what how it came out of in the end. 
I think it has to do with 1.3 hungry mouths, okay. 1.3 billion hungry mouths. All right. Well, thank, thank you very much, and hopefully uh, we can use what we've learned in this agreement, which I think is a good one, right. to uh, expand to others and even domestic production. And, and I think, once again, uh, we're not done here. I think when we demonstrate uh, what we can do and the quality of U.S. beef coming in, I'm absolutely convinced when uh, those Chinese get a hold of U.S. beef, they're going to want more, they're going to trust it. There's, there's no doubt about it, and that's why we should be extremely proud of our U.S. producers and not let that tainted, potentially tainted stuff from Brazil come in. <laughs> Thank you.